Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the first annual Open Simulator Community Convention. I hope everyone is doing well this morning and has found their way to the keynote regions and is having a seat. Um, just to start things off this morning, we want to do a few quick housekeeping notes for those of you who are arriving at the conference venue for the first time today. First, we want to send a warm welcome to all of our attendees and a huge thank you to everyone who sponsored the conference, speaking at the conference, and all of our tirely, tirelessly hardworking volunteer team. Um, I hope you guys enjoy the venue and all of the things uh, that are here for you to do and see on the conference grid. Um, a couple of quick reminders. If you profile your avatar, if you are in world, you will notice that you are in one of four zone groups and that will correspond to your landing region and your keynote region. So if you're in zone group two, you should teleport to landing zone two and keynote zone two. Um, we do that to prevent any a single region from getting completely overwhelmed. So we're trying to sort of prevent cascading failure, if you will, which cross your fingers and knock on wood will not happen today. So in the event of technical difficulties, if something were to happen in the region that you're in, we just ask that you wait for a few moments, keep an eye on the Twitter stream using the hashtag OSCC13, and then try to log in again and we'll try to get things back into motion and stick to the schedule as much as possible. Another reminder for those attending presentations, when you arrive on the keynote regions or any of the breakout zones, we ask that you do please sit as soon as you arrive. Um, in all of our testing, we've discovered that the grid performs much better, uh, the simulator performs much better if we have sitting avatars, so that will really help us have a very successful conference today. Uh, if you haven't checked the schedule, go to conference.opensimulator.org. The schedule is completely online. All of the sessions and descriptions and speakers should be there. We have a couple of really exciting lunchtime social events uh, for the meal break. Uh, it might be dinner for some of you in our European audience. Uh, so check out those events and we'll have breakout sessions following this keynote. Um, I think that's it for the housekeeping. We hope you have a wonderful time at the conference. And I'm going to turn things over to Justin to introduce this morning's panel. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, Chris, uh, Philippe. Um, hello, everyone. Hello again to uh, the second day, as, as Chris says, of the uh, conference. Thanks a lot, everybody, for coming. So uh, one of the interesting things about OpenSim is that it can be used uh, in a many different contexts, whether it's social grids or uh, or kind of private content design. Um, but it's also a very interesting uh, area of innovative applications using OpenSim, using the kind of 3D environment to do things um, which weren't really possible or would be rather expensive and difficult to do with proprietary game systems or other kinds of engines. So here today we have uh, three speakers who have very kindly agreed to come and give uh, a presentation and answer uh, questions about that particular topic. So if I go on my, so immediately on my left here is, well, uh, for me facing you, but uh, on, left most on the stage from your perspective is uh, Krista Lindstrom, who, uh, who Krista's uh, worked with, and I think even um, Nebadan has worked with closely. Uh, and he's a co-founder of the International Institute of Sustainable Transportation, and he leads a global effort to research and develop an automated transport system using solar and other kinds of re renewable energy. But he's also here, I think, to talk about uh, a company he co-founded called Incitra, or I hope I'm saying that right, <laughs> Krista, um, which is basically uh, using OpenSim to create collaborative visualiz visualization environments from 2D data for urban planning and real estate development purposes. So next to Krista on the stage is uh, Klaus. Um, Klaus is, uh, I've known for a long time, and I, I work uh, with Klaus for quite a while. He's, a, he's an entrepreneur and a leader in developing strategic innovation for market success. And he's got over 25 years of building businesses and consulting to premier clients worldwide. What he's going to talk about here today is, uh, is a company called, uh, of which he is in charge called uh, 3D Avatar School, which, was using, which is using OpenSim to, to basically... Um, be able to engage children in educational environments in uh, in different ways of teaching, innovative ways of teaching in, in more kind of a, a game kind of way and be able to do very interesting things with the platform there which uh, he will talk about. And finally on the stage is uh, Douglas Maxwell who many of you may know 
um, Douglas con conducts research into the use of virtual environments for uh, strategic applications as a science and technology manager for the US Army Research Lab um, in Orlando, Florida. So he's also the founder of the Military Users of Virtual Worlds Working Group and a virtual world tech advisor to the office, um, the, Dep the officer of deputy under Secretary of Defense. Sorry, I'm <laughs> gabbling my words slightly. Uh, the deputy under Secretary of Defense Readiness. I'm not used to used to these uh, U.S. kind of titles. But I think what he's going to here to talk about mainly is uh, is a is a uh, is a kind of grid he founded as a director called the Moses, which is the Military Open Source Enterprise Strategy. Um, which is exploring how to use kind of flexible environments like OpenSim to to do uh, various different kinds of training which aren't possible in kind of more traditional gaming environments. I hope I've got that right, Doug, but you can correct me uh, if I haven't in the presentation. So first up uh, to speak is, is going to be Doug, in fact. So Doug, if you care to uh, take the podium, I'm happy to hand over. Uh, thank you, Justin. Uh, that uh, actually was probably one of the best introductions I've ever had. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. And this uh, this conference is a testament to the the coming maturity of the Open Simulator uh, platform. And I'm I'm very pleased to to see how well this is, has come off. Uh, just to give you an example, the uh, the Federal Consortium for Virtual Worlds in uh, November of 2007. Uh, only had a couple of dozen attendees and so for the Open Simulator Community Conference to be able to have a virtual uh, version of a conference uh, which is something that, that we uh, have dreamed about doing for years uh, is, is just fantastic and, and I think it's a testament to all the hard work and maturity of this. Uh, th like I said, thank you again for, for having me and your um, uh, interest in, in our work. Uh, my name is Douglas Maxwell, uh, please just call me Doug, and uh, I work for the Army Research Lab, uh, the Human Research and Engineering Directorate. Uh, Justin is right, we have um, impossibly long uh, titles and names, uh, so please, Doug is fine. Uh, what I want to talk to you today, though, is about uh, the genesis of Moses, where Moses came from, uh, where we are today, and where we're going. Uh, specifically, um, my... Um, uh, my mandates, uh, my guidance comes from the Training and Doctrine Command, which is an area of the Army that is responsible for uh, soldier training. And I will uh, read an excerpt from the, the learning concept uh, that they put out uh, around 2010, uh, which is the Army must have an adaptive uh, development and delivery system, uh, one that extends knowledge to soldiers at the operational edge. Uh, and is capable of updating learning content rapidly and is responsive. Um, what does that remind you of? So back in 2010, the Army had uh, already been using virtual environments for, for various training purposes for about 15 years. So why would they put out a statement like that in their future vision? Uh, I was curious. I, I, I was actually a bit confounded by that. Uh, so I did a, big, a bit of digging, and it turns out that their, their current uh, virtual environments were all based on first-person shooters. Uh, and as you well know, the, the first-person shooters come with certain limitations. Uh, one of those limitations is uh, they're, they're expensive to populate and maintain. The, the art pipeline starts way back at the, the Maya Max stage in, photos, in Photoshop. Uh, which is not, un, uh, not unreasonable. Uh, but then you have to go through a world building stage. You have to prepare a level. And then you put that level into the uh, simulation engine or the game engine, and then you end up with a, a static level. And uh, one of the things that we find remarkable about virtual worlds is their uh, wonderful flexibility. Uh, every object uh, in here is an, is an agent. Uh, other than the expense, uh, you, you can spend literally millions of dollars on uh, levels in these AAA title games. Uh, they also have certain technical limitations. Uh, for one thing, you can only put a finite number of users in each level. Uh, usually those levels are capped for performance reasons or to, uh, to maintain a certain level of performance and frame rate. The uh, complexity of the scenes and the areas of operation. Uh, we would like to see very large areas represented, and usually uh, in the first person shooters, you're limited to a few square kilometers. 
So, uh, lastly, and probably the most important, there's information assurance restrictions. They they weren't deemed safe enough to deploy on a large large scale. Uh, usually, they were just put in a in a classroom. So this all points to a solution to the the Tradox call uh, in the the realm of virtual worlds. So we would like to properly represent uh, our environments. Uh, we'd like to accurately represent our environments, which means that we need uh, advanced uh, terrain import tools. Uh, we need to be able to represent cultures uh, correctly. Uh, culture meaning not just uh, peoples, but also uh, landmarks and buildings, etc. You know, the entire environment has to be done well. So if you look at the uh, the picture at the bottom uh, left, you know we've been looking at some of the AAA titles such as uh, CryEngine and uh, in Unreal, and uh, I, I get asked questions uh, frequently. What about the the graphics quality? Uh, well, if you look at the uh, picture on the right, uh, the graphics quality uh, is what we would deem good enough. Uh, what we're hearing from the Army Research Institute, which is the the cognitive psychology arm of the Army Research area uh, is that you don't necessarily need photorealistic um, representations of your environment. You need graphics that are good enough to capture, captivate, and create immersion, uh, but the extra expense that you go beyond that good enough to the photorealistic uh, may be too expensive to, to reasonably expect. So we took a look at Second Life back in uh, 2008, and it uh, it gave us a, a glimpse of of uh, what the future could look like in in uh, alternate virtual environments. Uh, flexibility obviously was the the biggest thing that attracted us, um, but we also recognized that we couldn't operate on the open internet. Uh, the uh, military has not only content, uh, but the usage of the content uh, can make uh, the uh, activity sensitive. So we worked with Linden Lab to to produce the the enterprise unit, um, and uh, uh, there are a lot of industrial users as well. Uh, but we worked with them to to make it more secure. Uh, when they abruptly canceled the enterprise product, we were kind of left in a lurch. Uh, the uh, federal government contracting process is a Byzantine, uh, very complicated and, and time-consuming um, activity. So we uh, uh, couldn't just cancel all of our, our, <laughs> our activities uh, and, and stop on a dime. So we needed to look for a way to, to get off of the enterprise and the open simulator uh, looked very attractive to us. And so that's when I created the, the Moses. Uh, you'll notice that the last S in Moses is for strategy. Uh, we are not a solution provider. We're not a, a service. Uh, we are an exploratory activity. And uh, so uh, we provide uh, the information and data that we learn back to the community and back to our, our collaborators. So in our year one goals, uh, we're, we're quite literally to uh, replicate the Second Life Enterprise. Uh, we needed a persistent virtual world, uh, persistent being key. Uh, we needed backup and redundancy. That is something we didn't have in the open Second Life public grid, and it's something that we had to a small extent to in the enterprise. Uh, it needed to be completely self-contained and disconnected from the internet. So we needed voice over IP. We needed all the grid services, everything uh, that could happen on our um, uh, open grid. Uh, one moment, my viewer just crashed. So, in the year one, we had to replicate the uh, Second Life Enterprise. Uh, we also wanted to reach out to other, uh, other people who were using the open simulators, specifically the other people who were in industry and in the uh, military domains. We wanted to know what they were learning. We didn't want to go this alone. We recognized early on that this had to be a community effort. So I invited our academics, I invited our other military, even some of our civilian uh, collaborators to come in as well. And so inside the Moses grid, uh, you'll find that there's a very diverse community of users. 
Let me hop back on the podium. So what does year two have in, in store for us? In year two, we want a practical vision. Uh, quite literally, we want to know what is this technology actually used for. The technology has not been validated, ironically. Unlike the Air Force's uh, flight simulators, the um, infantry soldiers don't have an accredited unit of training that they can go through inside the virtual environment. Um, here we go. Can everyone hear me okay? We hear you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. So, in the practical vision, we want to uh, foster and develop uh, high-value soldier skills. Uh, we want to expand upon the, the current small unit trainers and go with multiple unit training. We want to know uh, if uh, there is actually a value in this type of training, uh, in this extra flexible training, for example. Uh, we want to know if allowing the soldiers to train from a home station uh, with mission editing capabilities, uh, can they be uh, accredited and given uh, credit uh, in their jackets uh, for training, rather than just taking a paper test, for example. So we have set up a number of tests that we are planning to undertake over the next year uh, to actually begin providing for um, uh, uh, proof of this. So uh, one of the things that we want to know is uh, if you provide a large number of agents in the system, uh, can you increase the kinds of training that you do uh, inside the virtual environments? So, for example, if you're in a first-person shooter that can only accommodate uh, 30 to 40 uh, users, uh, that gives you um, enough training for, say, a platoon, but there's no overhead left over for enemy or um, uh, white forces for your regular, regular villagers. So they're largely uh, training in a, in a vacuum. Uh, if we were to provide a environment that allowed for hundreds of users, uh, whether they be human or, or bot, uh, does that increase the realism of the uh, training environment in such a way that it provides something meaningful for them to exercise, say for example, their cultural knowledge? Uh, in this particular uh, picture, this is a screen grab from one of the previous DSG experience, uh, experiments that we did with Intel this summer. Um, the uh, experiments were designed to test the DSG technology, uh, but rather than uh, having a whole bunch of people try to log in and stand around uh, with nothing really to do, uh, we set up a, a role play scenario for them. Uh, the idea was to give them something meaningful to do uh, during the uh, two-hour time period that we performed our sampling uh, of the servers. Uh, it turns out that this almost took a, a life of its own, and we had a lot of people who really got into it. Uh, as you can see in the screenshot, we had uh, a very good participation. Uh, flexibility. Uh, one thing that uh, this type of technology has uh, that the first-person shooters don't have is that uh, you can make uh, changes to the technology, excuse me, to the, to the arena, the sim, uh, 
uh, while it's running. You don't have to go back to a world builder. You don't have to uh, rebake lighting. You don't have to uh, basically start from scratch if you want to make changes. Uh, that gives us a number of advantages. One is cost. Uh, you can cheaply and inexpensively uh, increase or decrease the level of difficulty of the training. Uh, and you can do it very quickly, so you also save time. Uh, we would like to create um, uh, tailored uh, mission editors that allow for modifications to the scenario. Uh, if we have a, uh, a trainer that is observing a unit that is doing a bit too well, uh, we would like for them to be able to increase the difficulty. Um, while the unit is, is in the, the unit of instruction and they may not even know that the adjustment is going on. Uh, conversely, if we have someone who is struggling, we might want to dial it back a bit and you know, let them catch up. Uh, we want to make sure that they are learning what they need to know, when they need to know, and um, again, we recognize there's no one-size-fits-all. The uh, performance comparison test is one that we're very excited about. Um, this one um, is uh, a bit unconventional. So uh, I'll set this up. We, uh, we do a, a common task called room clearing, and, and that is where a squad uh, of four soldiers uh, is tasked to uh, search and clear uh, areas uh, such as apartments or, uh, or whatnot. So, Whenever they're trained to do this, um, they go through what's called a mount facility, a military operations in urban terrain. Uh, it's usually a, a mock-up of a village or a city, uh, and that's where they, they practice uh, the, uh, the room clearing activity. Uh, during the crawl phase of the activity, it's called a dry fire. Uh, they're uh, not given any blank or live rounds, but they, they do still have their weapons. And they go through the, the choreograph, they, they go through the uh, tactics and strategy of how to do a proper room clearing, uh, depending on the kind of room that they, that they encounter. Uh, during the walk phase of this activity, uh, they're given blanks, and the validation authority, their, um, their company commander, uh, assesses them while they're going through this. They do have blanks, they, they are firing. Um, but they are forced to go through this over and over and repeat it uh, until the uh, validation authority says that uh, they've done it correctly and they're allowed to proceed to the, the live fire exercise. And that's when they are using real bullets and, and they are uh, shooting at targets inside the rooms. So during this year's uh, activities, uh, we're going to replace the crawl phase, the, the dry fire phase, with our... Um, uh, control unit uh, with our control uh, group and uh, they um, will be using the Moses uh, to go through their tactics and strategy to practice uh, their entry into the rooms and their uh, cover and clearance before they're allowed to go out into the field uh, with the blanks. Uh, what we want to do is um, to have a um, objective and measurable uh, way to figure out if there is an equal or better um, uh, training effectives out effectiveness outcome uh, using the virtual uh, rather than uh, taking up the resources of the uh, live uh, training environment. Uh, so an obvious measure is uh, if they take just as many times to redo the walk uh, as they do uh, with the people who are in the crawl, uh, then we can say that they, they equal the effectiveness. Um, if they take more times, uh, if they have to redo the walk uh, more times than the other group, uh, then they didn't get as, as much out of it. Uh, and then again, uh, we feel comfortable with allowing them to do the crawl phase inside the virtual environment. Um, before going out to the, the live because they do have that blank fire phase in between. So lastly, I want to talk about metrics and milestones. Um, 
right now we're at about the 40 to 60 user um, that is usable uh, we want to get to 300 using the DSG uh, eventually we want to go to uh, an unlimited amount of users which would mean that it would be hardware bound and not uh, software bound the virtual operational area we can do about six square kilometers in Moses right now again we want to get to unlimited uh, based on the available hardware resources, not due to any uh, software limitations. Uh, we want to increase the, the complexity of the agents in the sims. Uh, specifically, we want to jump on the uh, physics and get physics uh, in shape. Uh, for example, our vehicles kind of look like uh, land speeders from uh, Star Wars. Uh, we want to get articulated joints and ground clamping between the, the tires and the ground. Um, mission editors, we want to get um, this user interface uh, changed in su such a way that the training community can easily use it and modify the, the scene uh, based on their needs and do it while it's running. Um, I think I'll end it there. I'm being handed the shipper's hook. Uh, does anyone have any, any questions? I, I certainly have uh, a few questions, but I think we'll uh, we'll probably take them through it. Well, unless there's anything really specific now for Doug. Okay, I think we'll 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 go through. We'll we'll open it up for questions at the end. And if anybody has anything, uh, please bring it up then. Okay, thanks a lot, Doug. Okay, so we're going to have a slight change to the order now. I'm sorry, Klaus, I, I, I probably just about to spring this on you, but Krista, uh, sorry, Krista Lopez just had a, a quick problem. She's helping with the slides for uh, uh, Krista Lindstrom's presentation. So I wonder if you could actually go next. Would that be okay? Yes, absolutely. If I can get my avatar with the short trousers right. here. <laughs> oh, I just I just sat down there, so I already got. Oh, out. did yeah. you? Oh, so yeah, Krista. Krista Lopez just told me she. Uh, so no problem. And, I, I'll go back. So. Okay. So back. who should, should do next? Yeah. So if you could, uh, if you could just. Uh, okay. One second. Let me just. Uh, let's, uh, sit down the interesting. Yep. Yeah. There we go. There are my slides. Okay. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I can I can see you I can see you fine at least, Klaus. Okay. <laughs> I see you did go. Is it a hot day in Hong Kong today? Then I see you did go for the short uh, trousers. Ah, yes, indeed, indeed. It was. It's like always a hot day in Hong Kong, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's hot and humid. Can you see the slides? Uh, see. Not yet. Okay, give it a second here. I think it should be in there. Let me just do this again. Yeah, it was actually. It's you're right. It's always hot and it's always humid. <laughs> and one gets very used to that after a while. Yes, we're just still sorting out the slides. Yep. Folks, tell me if you have any issues, Klaus. Well, the only thing is it worked fine earlier, the typical demo effect. Let me drag them over carefully. Yeah, yeah I still see the, um, the Moses slides, but... Oh, did... Uh, so... So does clicking the delete button have any effect? Klaus, if um, you could try clicking the home button at the top of that panel. The There's a little yeah, red yeah, home this. icon. Yeah, yeah, that might reload says, them. Go to the beginning. This is what yep. I did earlier. I say yes. Um, yeah, and there's the confirmation box, of course, a yes, no for that. Yes, but it still seems to. Well, it's... Right. 
still seems to have 87 slides and I only have 29. <laughs> Extra slides. Let me see if I can, maybe I can delete. Let me just delete the previous presentation. Maybe that does the trick. Well, my presentation is sort of separate because it's the first one after the, well, it's the second one, so it is different in a way. Okay, that Fine. seems to have cleared it. So if you try dragging again, hopefully that will be a yes. success. Well, I agree. That's the trick, I think. Let's hope, fingers crossed. Slide one of 29. This looks good. Yes, I think I'm sort of confident. That looks good to me. Does it? Okay, then it's better than what you guys have. But what I can see. Okay, it hasn't come through here yet. Okay, anyway, so you see the, the title slide? Then Funnily uh, enough, I, I don't yet, but other people can see it, right? Well, neither do I, actually. I still see the... Uh, Anyway, just be patient with us, you guys. It won't be a minute, as they say in the UK. <laughs> One more time. Yeah, yeah, I still did this. see the Moses one. They were so impactful, it's hard to get rid of them. <laughs> it's actually really interesting, Doug, because I have... Um, yeah, maybe we need to actually reset the... Uh the script we do see we do seem to have a little bit of a technical difficulty if you could bear with us a yeah. second okay yeah if you guys shall I let you guys do something with this yep give me just one second here and we'll try doing this the um, okay we'll get this reset for you just one second and thanks everyone who's watching for your patience it wouldn't be a conference without a technical problem right <laughs> <laughs> right Okay, I'm looking, g give us just one second here. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's looking like we may need to actually restart the region that we are in. So when that happens, everyone who's in Keynote 1 right now probably is going to either need to teleport away or um, you might get booted and have to re-log and that will be the same for our presenters. So we'll try to bring right. the region up. Really? Uh, <laughs> These are the kinds of things that we, we always hope won't happen, but we always have fallback plans in the event that they do.
If I if I just start, maybe uh, talk about maybe ask you a few questions, Doug. Uh, quickly, so I think one of the so I can't remember exactly who asked this, but I think one person was asking, what is the um, how realistic is it for the soldiers? And I guess my my corollary question would be, how much does that matter? Well, we we can only measure the the realism for the soldiers by by watching uh, their reactions while they're inside the the system. Uh, for example, uh, if we give them something to do, uh, and uh, they they go and perform their uh, their objective, and they jump right back out. Uh, we, we watch to see if they continue looking for things to do in the system or if they continue operating in the system. Uh, I've seen some experiments where they do their, their, their assigned task uh, and then they immediately uh, put their hands down or jump into their cell phones. Uh, what that tells us is that they were simply doing as they were told and uh, they weren't uh, very engaged. Uh, I've seen other experiments where uh, they start getting self-motivated and they look for other things to do or they begin exploring uh, and they begin um, forming uh, uh, self-cohesive uh, teams. They, uh, they start looking for things to do. Uh, the level of the graphics um, seems to have less to do with their engagement. Uh, right now, um, the the second life slash open simulator graphics are, are kind of an example of the um, the lower end of graphics fidelity. Uh, what seems to get them is the the kinds of uh, tasks. Uh, if you give them an environment, say in a first person shooter, where they can't really interoperate with with anything except for what the designers uh, set out to do, like a door or uh, a very limited set of of, of activities, they get bored fairly quickly. Uh, in these non-determinant uh, environments where they literally can touch and uh, uh, discover, uh, they can interact with anything in the environment, uh, that's when we seem to capture them and to keep their attention. Okay, I'm being told that uh, people can, for anybody listening to the stream who was there, uh, people can re-log to Keynote 1 now. Of course, that might be a bit delayed. Everybody kind of logs back in at once, but it is it is back now. So if people could head back there, that would be great. I'm just going to uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So some of the other questions I had, I, I well, I had personally. I think um, I think you covered a lot of the interesting ground, especially to do with uh, the fact that it's different from kind of traditional first-person shooters, which, which it sounds like many of these systems have been traditionally based on. Because um, I, I think one interesting thing you're doing with Moses is adopting kind of almost a, uh, as you say, there, you had a, rather than have people stand around doing nothing during the, the load tests that you were conducting, you actually had a kind of, uh, a, kind of a, a kind of scenario, a well-placed scenario, for anybody to come in and actually participate in. And I, I found this very interesting because you know, you're kind of opening up. I, I know there is a, certainly a selection of the people. I mean, you know, there's a selection of people because it's the people who are interested in, in what you're doing. But it's still people very much who, who aren't, you know, who are, who are not soldiers in real life or anything like that and, and maybe don't know pretty much the first thing about being a soldier. But, I mean, did some kind of, are some kind of interesting results coming out of that? Is that, is that actually quite an interesting thing to be, for you to be doing? Yes, it is. Um, in fact, the uh, the kind of activities that we had the soldiers per, per doing, and, and I'm talking about the soldier roles, they're actually civilian volunteers, uh, was called a key leader engagement. And, and that's a common activity uh, in, in theater. Uh, just trying to figure out who is really in charge of an area. Uh, and it may not be the guy who's oldest or has the longest, grayest beard. Uh, is is actually in charge, but trying to figure out who is in charge in an area is is critical uh, to uh, to their mission, and so we tried to give the uh, the soldier roles the skills and the abilities for um, them to go in and to query the other civilian uh, volunteers uh, to try to figure out um, who was actually uh, in charge. Uh, we told the civilians, uh, we gave them all the information they needed to behave in a, in a culturally correct way. We gave them some pre-training. Uh, overall, it was, it was a very satisfying experience and, and it, it gave 
uh, the volunteers you know, something meaningful to do. And in fact, they stuck around for hours after the uh, event was over in some cases. Um, and they, they really took their role seriously. Uh, and we plan to have more events like those as we increase uh, the scale uh, of our activities in the in the future. So anyone who is interested in taking place in the next round of uh, DSG testing, um, uh, watch out for uh, the announcements in the social media. Okay, great. So we're slowly re-establishing uh, Keynote 1 now. I've been able, for instance, myself to get back in world. Although it's going to take a short period, I think, because uh, it's probably a fair bit of traffic happening on the sim. Right. So I think you're already... Uh, whoa. You're already sitting at the, the, uh, the podium, aren't you, uh, Klaus? Yes, and I try to load it. I still see the old slides, but somebody said they can see uh, my slides, so that's uh, that's good. Okay, I'm just going to wait. A f I think we we'll just wait uh, a minute or two yeah, for the. Yeah, yeah I, I see your first slide, for instance. Um, I don't. Okay, but that's okay. Can you, Klaus? Can you try ad advancing to the next slide, just so we can make sure that that's all going oh, through yeah, okay? Fine. I just click that. Do you see the next slide? I do see the next slide. Okay, for some reason I don't, but never mind, I know what they are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so we're back up, up to an, an, a recorded 80 avatars again, so I imagine that means probably most people have got back in, but I'm sure people can come along as as they are. So, um, so Klaus, are, are you ready? Yes, I am. Um, great, let's get started then. Um, and by the way, if, if people have questions or comments, do feel free to um, to place that right into uh, into the chat here. Um, so basically, I'm going. My name is Klaus Nem. So I'm uh, here in Hong Kong, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about a project and a company we did for the last three years. And um, we actually worked very closely with, with Justin here. So uh, there will be technical detail that I would be very happy, Justin, if you jump in and add and so forth, because you're actually closer to some of the technical details than I'm. Um, basically, let's see, can you see the slide, um, the next slide with uh, my background? Um, basically, my background is sort of consulting with uh, Booth, Allen and Hamilton, for example, when it was still one company and uh, the military arm wasn't acquired yet by Carly. Um, and then um, I started, uh, well, did one startup called Shazam, which is a music recognition company. And then um, sort of the relevant bits and pieces came in 2006, 2007, when I was working with a UK, although global consulting company called uh, PA Consulting. And we actually did a virtual office, of course, in Second Life at the time. So I was sort of very involved with experimenting, like I think like many of you, with the um, sort of the second life, the virtual world, the interactive, uh, you know, components, what can you do with it? And at the time, uh, I think, you know, in hindsight, this was mostly experimentation, sometimes for clients. Um, for example, in the healthcare sector, we built um, healthcare seminars for Cigna and others and uh, did various things. And then when I came to Hong Kong, um, we did uh, team building exercises uh, for clients like FedEx. And uh, then we set up 3D Avatar School about in 2010. And 3D Avatar School is about um, teaching children, 10 to 15 year old children, originally Chinese and then English in China. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that project is about because it's, um, in some ways, of course, there's similar things to what Doug talked about, but certain things are, you know, different and very unique probably. And we obviously used uh, OpenSim and the viewer and so forth. And uh, two months ago, we got acquired by our Chinese investor and they're going to take the business more into mainland China. We won a bunch of uh, awards for this uh, along the way. But let me talk about uh, what's more interesting. That now I can see my own slides. That helps too. About the... Um, the business and the, the product. Uh, so the, the the background was really the traditional English education, particularly put yourself into the shoes of uh, kids, 10 year old kids uh, in one of the provinces, third tier cities, some in rural China. Government is telling you you should be learning English, your parents, uh, in fact, your grandparents with a child, uh, one child policy are all telling you you should be learning English. Of course, you don't care because nobody speaks English there. So a big problem is the, uh, is the motivation and the um, sort of the, 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 yeah, the motivation. And another one is that those classes are very big and often have teachers that are not native speakers. So those are some of the problems that people were facing. 
And um, what we basically built against that, if you see the slide now that talks about the um, uh, combined, we combined the, the classroom-based learning with a lot of online game mechanics. So what we did not do is we did not have a virtual classroom where people sitting in virtual chairs in the way we're doing this now, uh, but rather free-flowing games. And they're designed like a um, storyline, so it's almost like a TV episode. You're you know, in a spaceship with, uh, by the way, with only six students. So that's one thing that was very different uh, from our requirements here. We did not have very large uh, concurrency. We had small class sizes, six students, and one of the avatars, so the seventh avatar would be a live teacher. And we uh, created really, um, we created um, games, um, about f uh, six months worth of games at the end. And um, a lot of game mechanics were involved there as well. Um, of course, also a lot of reports and metrics and analytics and so forth. And, you know, a little bit of classroom, you see sort of one of the whiteboards in there. But that totally changed the game because um, the kids didn't think they, they were, you know, learning English. They thought they're playing multi-user games, like a World of Warcraft kind of thing. And that was pretty, provided the, uh, the motivation. That was the, the very strong factor. Um, let me see which slides are we seeing now. Um, okay, this one should be talking about um, uh, about the, the, the uh, leveling up. So basically we had mechanics, typical game mechanics that students when they come in, they have a certain level, they start sort of as a space cadet and then they move up. Uh, in the storyline where they're basically on the spaceship, the spaceship crashes, they have to rebuild the spaceship and go through a whole series of English adventures, hence the product name English Adventure Land, where they have to speak um, English along the way. And during this, they get uh, up on titles, so they become uh, get more and more coins, and they, get, they level up, basically, their leaderboards and all sorts of other game mechanics that were involved. So it's, again, it's very different from a virtual classroom uh, kind of setting for the kids, it's really much more like a like a game. Um, so, with things, for example, like team-based learning, where uh, the, the students sometimes they work by themselves, sometimes they have to work together to solve certain English problems, and they were all designed from a pedagogic perspective. How do you teach English as a second language? So, we had uh, pedagogic didactic experts, we had game designers, and that's sort of the secret sauce. Really, was to combine the pure game design um, and the um, uh, and the pedagogic, per yeah, and I, I come to the um, to the viewer indeed, or let me just bring this up now. So one of the things, in fact, you see it at this slide here, it's a good question. Uh, did we adapt the viewer for that? Indeed we did, because the viewer, like most of us, what we're here using now here with lots and lots of menus that were originally designed for content creators, that's not what we wanted. It was totally, uh, you know, distracting. So we basically put a lot of work into the viewer, and it's all open source. Um, so basically, there was the war on buttons. We took all of the buttons and all of the menus and all that crap out that you know the, the user of this kind of uh, environment doesn't need because the kids are not supposed to create content. They're supposed to learn English in this environment. So what you see actually on this screen is we used heads-up displays, huts, and you know very limited number of interaction that we carefully designed, and we took everything else out. So basically, it was one of the huge technical challenge to take everything out that the kids would not use when they were using this environment. And that's something that I think is, you know, was always one of the major obstacles in my experience for any kind of corporate use as well, because this viewer was constructed for many different things, not just for, you know, use, usage of a well-designed uh, and structured environment. Um, so that's a good, uh, good question. Another thing we used here on the gamification side, we used virtual items. So combination to keep things interesting for the kids, uh, because again, they're you know unruly ten to twelve year old. Um, uh, so you know we need to, to keep things interesting. So they are walking. Sometimes they're in one room. Sometimes they go out into the garden and they have to find flowers and you know do certain tasks and. Uh, and missions, yes, the question is, is this viewer uh, open source? Absolutely it is, and I think um, uh, Justin will be able to, to point more to where this thing can be found. Um, but we basically use the backend open simulator and the viewer, the open, the open source components. Um, other things that we did here, um, for example, most of the, the lessons and the design was with a live teacher. So that was the facilitator, the coach, uh, six students per one teacher. But in some cases, we use bots and you know non-player characters because it also keeps things uh, interesting and fluid. Um, so that the you know because this, the lesson was about one hour long, 
uh, that we didn't lose the attention of the kids. Other things we did, well, you know, we got a tremendous amount of very good press here in, uh, in Hong Kong and in China about this kind of thing. And to some extent, I think this is because the gamification of education hasn't reached the level of public awareness that you find in the US or in the, in the UK and the West, basically. Uh, so this was something still new, which was very positive for us. And you know, the bottom line is the kids really love this kind of thing. They, you know, one one quote was that the teachers found that the kids wanted to learn more English in the traditional classes that they also have, of course. So this was an augmentation of their learning, uh, not because all of a sudden they realized that <laughs> English is the way for social uh, upward mobility, but um, that they were um, they were basically interested in playing our game better. So that's sort of inherent um, uh, implicit motivation was a very strong factor. So we got a lot of good press, which helps. Now let me talk about some of the technical, um, some of the technical challenges that we encountered. And Justin, feel free to uh, jump in here because, for example, the um, the Amazon thing I think I didn't talk much about here. Um, now some of the uh, technical challenges were around that we had to deploy the servers, you know, Doug talked about, we couldn't use Second Life, of course, uh, not just because of the control uh, aspects, but also because it was, um, you know, we, we needed to deploy, to deploy this within mainland China, partly because of the Great Firewall of China, the censorship thing that adds latency that would be unacceptable in an operational environment, for particularly for the voice. So we basically had to do um, various technical things we could deploy, basically sort of created our own Second Life enterprise, if you will, that we could put originally on Amazon and then into China, uh, China data centers as well as in Hong Kong. We talked a little bit, we, you know, we vastly simplified the, the viewer, the client software that was really necessary and it made a huge difference in terms of, and I think this could be a, applicable for corporate settings as well. Um, we needed to do a lot of stuff. In fact, you know, we just had a, you know, various crashes and things here. We never had that in, um, you know, at the end in the production environment in China. So it really became a very stable environment, which was very positive and again, necessary because, you know, this was a paid production environment. Uh, but we couldn't afford any downtime. We had up to 180 um, students taking classes in parallel, but again, those were sort of 30 different environments with 30 live teachers, and we had about 1,000 kids live. So this the stability of the environment, and I think various things around the testing and building test harnesses and so forth. Another thing that we um, we found was a problem is, you know, the gray avatars, the white clouds, um, you know, kids and teachers don't understand it, are not very forgiving. So we were working on some uh, caching systems, but um, they were not quite uh, completed and in production. That would have made that much, much faster because in essence, different from, slightly different from what Doug was talking about, um, we did not plan to have any changes in the live environment, but rather, um, you know, something that was designed once and then would just be uh, used by people. Um, so we wanted to get rid of the, uh, basically to preload, uh, pre-cache all the environment. Um, physics, Doug mentioned that um, obviously game designers always want to use physics and really exploit the, the capabilities. We had limitations there, but we managed to work, to work around this uh, by various sort of scripting tricks and so forth. Um, so at the end, it was sufficient what we had. It would have been nicer to have a better physics engine, but it was not uh, a showstopper for what we did. And, you know, the game designers worked around that. I already mentioned we had a high concurrency of classes, and that was sort of really it was built to be scalable to eventually serve all of China. Um, but uh, in each sim, if you will, uh, we did not have a very high concurrency. And that was mostly for pedagogic purposes because it was a very high extent of interactivity and participation as opposed to, you know, a large number of, of people interacting. Um, another interesting thing that was very necessary for us and might also came handy, come handy in, um, in corporate environments, we had to uh, go down to very low PC specs, sort of up to five-year-old pirated Windows XP machines. Uh, those were some of the technical uh, challenges. Let's talk about, uh, we can probably at the end, Justin, you can add some of the um, uh, the technical views from your perspective. We did have sometimes issues around the script complexity. There's always sort of inherent um, um, sort of potential conflict between what the scripters and the backend uh, developers wanted to do in terms of stability. So that we needed to, to negotiate some trade-offs there. Um, on the educational side, 
um, we basically had kids that had a very low level of English proficiency and that were not very motivated. So very different from, uh, you know, most situations, I think, because we started in one of the, um, the third tier uh, provinces in China, where, as I said, people are not inherently motivated to learn English. Uh, so that was one of the challenges. We had bilingual teachers, partly because of that and partly because of the firewall. So we needed to bring in teachers mostly from within China. We had some teachers from the Philippines. Those teachers obviously had never worked in this kind of thing. So, And we, for economic reasons, to run this profitable as a business, we needed to minimize the training. And we managed, you know, after some time to do this really well. And the, the teachers loved it as well, although it was totally new for them. Uh, we actually had some theater trainers to give them some voice training. And... Um, yeah, sort of because nobody had really done this before. On the um, the, the last slide here on the business challenge is um, basically this was a um, offering where we had, um, let me see. Uh, okay, well, far, last thing here was we had to combine on the educational side, sorry. We had to combine uh, a very strict and serious pedagogic teaching environment with the kids basically just having fun. And we needed to uh, ensure ongoing uh, quality assurance and training, which this environment actually had huge advantages. We could have the Filipino teachers teach the Chinese teachers and people jump into lessons to observe and do quality improvement. And that was uh, hugely uh, helpful. On the business challenge side slide, and this is uh, my last slide here, um, one of the challenges was that we had different um, different audiences because we basically had the kids. We needed to sell to the kids um, on a, a, a proposition that was, you know, you guys have fun and you play a game. We needed to be careful that this is not the message we wanted to give to the teachers and uh, parents in particular because they were sort of skeptical of the game. So we needed to tell to them, this is serious learning. Your kids are improving their English particular conversation. They're going to have better test results. It's going to be good for the kids. The teachers got this earlier. The parents also, but basically having different messages to different audiences. Um, and then finally, we had a globally distributed team. So Justin was part of the team. We had people in the UK, people in the US and Australia and Georgia, former Soviet Union, literally a very, you know, a globally distributed team because we couldn't find the technology skills in particular in, in Hong Kong. And then the final thing for those of you who have worked with mainland Chinese partner, it's an interesting uh, experience if you don't speak the same language as a Chinese guy who doesn't speak a word of English, a uh, business partner. And, uh, you know, my Mandarin is non-existent. And, you know, that was certainly one of the, the larger challenges uh, as well, but that's independent of the open sim environment. Um, yeah, those, I think, were some of the um, experiences we had. Um, so that's, uh, that's all from my side. If you guys have questions, feel free. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Klaus. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're running really tight on time now with the interruption. Um, so maybe actually, I just get, I just because I know Nick is asking a few questions here, um, and of course, I know a few people have, have said about the viewer. It's certainly uh, available open source. Um, I think it's one of these. I didn't have much involvement with the viewer side, as one might expect. It's one of these things where it was, it's like viewers in general. It can be quite difficult to build, but there's definitely the link. And I don't have it right with me right now, but I will dig it out. And I think Nick was just asking a few questions quickly. Um, whether whether the how how the results of um, when the kids were doing assignments, how the results were registered, or were the results registered in in a system somewhere? Yes, a good point. Um, we had sort of a simple um, uh, test systems after each lesson to see how much they had retained. And that was, uh, that was certainly important. And we uh, were planning to do much more in that respect. So eventually we would use the environment to uh, basically sort of do ongoing uh, results and, uh, and testing. But there was some you know, initial version of that in place. Okay, thanks a lot, Klaus. Okay, and uh, and for our final speaker here is uh, Krista, who, of course, now after a few interesting events, I introduced quite a, a long time ago. But he's, uh, I think, you're going to talk about um, and and Citra. Is that how you pronounce it, Krista? Uh, well, we say and Citra. And Citra, right? Great. Okay, yes. Yeah, so please, uh, when you're ready, take it away. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me at this conference. I enjoyed very much. Um, so I'm going to do a brief presentation about the Citra and how to use OpenSIM for, for creating sustainable cities for the future. 
And before going into the actual presentation, I just want to tell you why we're doing this. Um, and and uh, um, I'm very much involved in politics, uh, mainly in Sweden, but also to some extent in California, US, where I'm right now. Um, a major challenge for the world is, is the urbanization and the consequences of urbanization. Um, one, one major uh, issue most cities have is they're growing uh, and the countrysides are, are fastly um, um, diminishing in, in, in importance for, for the future. Uh, that also means that a lot of people need transportation, they need energy, and they, they, they need different kinds of services to be able to manage and how to live in the future. And the way we move around today using fossil-based uh, um, transportation systems, mainly cars, buses, etc., is in the long run totally unsustainable. So, so um, uh, what, I, what I saw um, in 2006, 2007 was that the tools available to do early stages planning and, and not only planning, just set out ideas to how to produce new, more interesting, and more sustainable cities, um, those tools didn't really exist. Um, there were a couple of interesting uh, software packages, but those were client-based, not web-based, and, and there were, some of them are extremely expensive or, or just toys. So uh, that's how we moved into the, the interesting world of OpenSIM, and I was introduced to this by, by Crystal Lopez. Okay, so let's go forward. So, um, so this presentation is on how open sim and citra technology can be utilized to facilitate communication of sustainable urban plans. So what this is, we're using the, the, the open simulator platform and, and this some of the software added on top of it in order to, for the communication. So for us, uh, this is a democracy tool. It's a communication tool on how to share a vision with many people involved in change processes because the change is, is real and it's, it's a very important to have people on board and understanding what it is you want to change. So, just a little history here. Um, the first model uh, was developed in, in 2009. Uh, what we did, um, the first commercial model, I should say, visualizing and simulating a train arriving from Stockholm to Uppsala Travel Center where they had a new kind of automated trans transportation network, also called a podcast system, installed. Um, the, the podcast system wasn't there, but they wanted to see how it could look like if they had it installed. Uh, and the project uh, moved ahead. So what happened was that we slowly also looked into other issues, for example, parking issues nearby um, between the football arena and, and a quite a big university hospital. Uh, that started in 2011, and summer of 2011, we started to do a complete four square kilometer model of an entire automated transit network. Uh, that was quite a challenge. It was interesting. We were kind of pushing the boundaries of, of what OpenSIM could do at that stage, and, uh, but it worked, and it was quite successful. Uh, the main stakeholders was the city of Uppsala, it was the county of Uppsala, it was the hospital and, and a couple of real estate uh, um, uh, owners uh, along this route where this automated system was supposed to go in. So um, how did this look in the beginning? Well, you have a photo to the left, how it looks in real life. That's Uppsala train station with a sculpture outside. And um, on the right side, you see how it became inside the model. Um, we mainly focused in the beginning on the train station setting and, and eventually, of course, grew it farther and farther away to, to, to go all the way from the, uh, from the train and uh, train station all the way to, to the university where it's actually a couple of kilometers farther away. A um, couple of pictures from that modeling. Um, you have on the upper left corner, you have another view of the um, of the train station and the proposed um, line of a, a PRT, a podcast system, and the upper right, you see some bikes, etc. At that stage, we did not have bike simulation. We have that today. Lower left corner was when we did some experiments having high-speed rail coming in, 
and lower right corner you see um, the first simulation we did of, of an automated transit network system uh, based on, on a technology from a Korean company called Vectus. Um, eventually, uh, this technology was more and more uh, adopted by the city of Uppsala, and we became, in, in uh, May 2013, the main event at, at a science and, and development fair for the city of Uppsala, and they decided to, to promote this technology, and they were looking for a new area. And in the little upper left corner, you see a little green area. It's not exactly the one we use, but it's very close. So they had a development area. They wanted to put in about 15,000 apartments total. And, and uh, this is a development that's going to go on for 12, 13 years. And this is divided into four phases. And they asked us to, to visualize the first phase. And in that first phase, there were eight different builders. And these builders had already, most of them, architectural drawings or just sketches on how they would like to, to put in their buildings. So what we did was uh, um, a completely new model that was based entirely on how the visual impact would be in, in, in that area, in that green space. Um, also, um, now, one of the new prerequisites was that they wanted us to put in biking here also. Um, so we were actually able to do a nice little biking feature into this. Um, I, I will just show you one model more. This is what we also have recently uh, developed, and that is the city of Sundberg in Sweden, who wanted to um, um, change an, a street into a pedestrian area. And this is the Sundberg model 2013. Uh, and that will be a pure democracy project. They will have a blog where you can actually go in and put in comments, and those comments will be shown inside the model on different screens. Okay, I would like to show a video now of, of uh, um, how our technology works. Uh, I'll go back to the OSB model you saw before. Um, I'm actually going to go back one slide here, so it's actually going to be this one. Okay, for some reason that doesn't show. There it comes. So, Krista, I think you could please play that video and the link I sent to you, I would appreciate it. While we're waiting for it, I assume I will see it uh, as soon as it gets live here. So, second. So this video is a screen capture of, of the, um, uh, of the so, um, Uppsala, uh, OSP, we call it the OSP model, that stands for the regional area where this development is actually going to, to be running. Um, it, it has buses, cars, and, and uh, a couple of views from different angles, uh, east, west, north, south. Krista's messaging right now. Okay, I won't see it, but I'll hear it, she says. Okay. So, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, I hear it. Yeah. Mm. So I'll just let it play for itself. Um, I hope everyone sees it. By the way, a lot of this was done uh, with um, uh, Nebadon. We've done an excellent job in, in this project. Really appreciate it. Okay. 
Oh, yes. Thank you, Krista. I see that you sent out the link for everyone so they can check it later. So for those of you who can't see it, we'll make sure that you, you uh, either look in the chat window, you'll see the link for it, or uh, just uh, copy it for later so you can actually see it. There are more, there are more videos available than this one. Okay, I hear from the sound, it's probably be pretty at the end now. Okay, Krista, you can stop it. Okay, so I'll just continue then. So um, th this gives you, I think, a pretty good um, picture. Uh, about uh, what we're doing um, and I think uh, uh, it's easier to understand when you see it like this and this actually shows the, the, the power of this. Um, I, I must say I've been involved in many projects in my life but to do these things have is extremely rewarding and people are really appreciating it and understanding and feel empowered that they can actually change the surrounding and, and have an impact on the future, not only their own but the children and friends etc. It also highlights um, the issues that might arise and, and it, it uh, makes people, regardless of from what position you are, if you're a business owner, if you're somebody living in an area, if you're involved in transportation planning, it doesn't really matter. Um, whatever, where you come from, you see the same thing and I mean, people can start communicating in a much more efficient way than they can do before. Um, so uh, for information, we just got a new contract. We're going to, to model the entire uh, airport of Stockholm, the Åland airport, and show how that area can work uh, together with the adjacent city and the transportation issues they're having between the airport and, and the, the adjacent city. And hopefully we can show something of that next year. Okay, so, um, so we just went through the live demonstration. So a couple of other issues here. I'm waiting for the slide to load here. So what is it, what we do? Well, it's about a vision that green development in urban areas is everyone's business. And as many as possible should have access to the change process. So it's a democracy tool. So we focus on using students and real estate and city stakeholders to make a very cost-effective basic model for all. The initial process is closed. The ready approved model is published on the internet. 
And the reason we have a close development in the beginning is that you don't really know what all the stakeholders want and don't want. So I'm very careful, we are very careful to publish anything until we got everybody's consent actually to publish. And that, that's very important. So this technology is disseminated and propagated to science centers, universities, and NGO stakeholders in the cities. And, and we very much encourage anyone who wants to use the technology in their city and want to be involved in planning to, to use this technology. And it's free. Uh, the only cost is for hosting the model and some uh, development, of course, of making the base models. Um, so uh, the business model uh, is approximately per square kilometer the cost is that is our cost between five, five to ten thousand euros, um, but it, that's extremely low cost, and, and uh, we're happy to be able to keep it at that. Um, I just give you a vision of a project we're working on here in California. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but California is now planning to have the first ever high-speed rail project, and in that high-speed rail project, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, to see if we can do a complete development through cities and how they can intensify making stations for these, how they can make uh, development adjacent to the stations, and of course transportation feeding so they don't need to have huge parking centers around each station, all the way from San Diego, Los Angeles, San Jose, San Francisco, and up to Sacramento. And right now we are in negotiations with the city of San Jose. Um, next slide. Um, so, uh, what, is, uh, what is our business model? Well, the, the, the pure uh, revenue mainly is coming eventually as we build the models for server hosting and, and support of those models and having people uh, subscribe to the models. And, and when I say subscribe, that's not for the main users. That, those are, that's for those who want to do changes in the model. The general public has no cost accessing it. Um, and the benefits are there's the same cost as hosting your own servers, software hosting, access, backup, updates included in, in the cost. You can access any time for anywhere by anyone in read-only mode, um, so that's a free part of it, um, et cetera. So you have a very flexible sim simulation, mass transit, traffic, and pedestrians in real time. And we have an, um, another piece of software you don't see here that I've been involved in developing for a huge construction company called Skanska. Uh, to take care of the actual building process and all the documents involved in there, because it can be several thousand documents to actually make such a model. And this allows stakeholders to collaborate through the web to share visions and proposals while receiving valuable input in a timely manner. And it's access to Incitra train consultants and models worldwide. So that's something we're building right now. Um, so how, how does this work? What, what is it that we do? And it's quite a long process to do this. Uh, first, you have to select a sector somewhere uh, by any sat satellite photograph with a certain amount of, of uh, uh, revolution. Uh, just so you know, I see questions coming on this chat window, so yeah. I, I, I will uh, hold off those until after. Hi, Chris. Yeah, unfor uh, unfortunately, uh, and this is very unfortunate because of some of the other interruptions, we've pretty much <laughs> run out of time now for people to get to the other session. This is the last slide. Okay, great. If you, yeah. yeah, so, so, um, so the, uh, the benefits are, are uh, and how this works, we select a set, I'm just going to go through this fast, we select a sector, we get the terrain data, aerial photos, we attach buildings to, to this photo, and through uh, some tools create transportation uh, uh, bots, etc., and, and, uh, and some light, sound, etc., and, and, and shadows, and at the very end, we just run the model. So um, I will skip this. Um, next slide. Uh, it, it's based in Delaware. It's a for-profit and the people involved. And I think that was it. Thank you. OK, great. Thanks Thanks very much, Krista. Uh, round of applause, everybody. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, because of some of the early disruptions, we've we've kind of run up against our our, our last time when we, we actually have to be able to leave some time for people to get to the other breakout sessions. But thanks very much. And sorry, I don't think we have an opportunity to take into questions. But I'm sure, Chris, I'm sure you'll be around a little bit afterwards, right? If people do want to uh, do want to talk to you about about this your presentation. Okay. 
Um, Sounds like we might have lost him off the call there. Right. <laughs> well, I was... I, I, I'm still here. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. I'm. 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 I'm sorry about that. Yeah. We've. We've kind of. I think it was just so interesting presentation. We just ran out of time. But yeah, if people want to. If people do want to, not to take anything away from the breakouts, but if people do want to talk to talk to any of our presenters, I mean, I can't speak for them, of course, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you know, people will be happy to answer any questions about, about what they've been doing. But no, thank you very much, everybody, for the presentations, presentations today. That was great. Right, and I'll just hand, hand back to Chris now, who, uh, who can take us forward into the next sessions. Great. Thank you, Justin. And definitely thank you to our panel. And I do apologize to our panelists and everyone in the audience and watching the stream. Unfortunately, with these cutting edge technologies, sometimes we have issues. So we appreciate your patience. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, the rest of the schedule today is a pretty full schedule. The next uh, session starts in about 10 minutes. And we do have a full slate of breakout sessions in all six breakout zones for both the 8.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. slots. So please do check the schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. I also want to remind everyone we do have a meal break scheduled into the presentation. It might be lunch or dinner, depending on where you are. Um, but during that time, we also have two sponsors. Our silver sponsor, Avenation, will have a meet and greet on Expo Zone uh, 6, and we hope you'll stop by and visit with them. And in Expo Zone 3, Silver Sponsor Simudyne also uh, will be talking about the launch of their new viewer uh, for the Microsoft Surface and PC, and their staff will also be available. So that's Avenation on the conference grid in Expo Zone 6 and Simudyne in Expo Zone 3. And do remember that the Expo Zones are public, so anyone with a hypergrid address uh, can come in and check those out. We also did account creation, so anyone who registered for a streaming ticket before 4 a.m. California time this morning should have an account to come into the grid. So we hope to see some of you folks joining us uh, for the rest of the day. And then finally, our next keynote will stop up, start up at 11.30 uh, following the meal break, and we will check uh, in with you guys then. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great time. Enjoy the rest of the conference, and we'll see you soon.